Brucham Aboim, again, welcome to our home. Thank you for attending. Um, again, this week on my thoughts, I would like to continue our examination of the ten plagues that God Almighty brought upon Paro, the Egyptian people, and the land of Egypt through both Moshe and Aaron. Hopefully, together we will gain deeper insights and learn lessons for life, all from the stories that the Torah tells us. As I've mentioned many times, nothing is an accident. The Malbim states the first plague was preceded by a public warning. The second plague, by a warning to Paro alone, and the third plague, without any warning whatsoever. He also states that the purpose of the ten plagues was to teach the children of Israel three successively higher levels of faith in God Almighty. The first was to prove that there is a creator. Second, to establish the concept of what we call Hashkoch of Pratis, divine providence, a realization that it is God who directs all that occurs in this world. And the third, to prove that there is none other like him that exists in the world. The Ramban states that only those plagues that were fatal to people were preceded by warnings. That being the case, the third, sixth, and ninth plagues, which are lice, boils, and darkness, which were not fatal, thereby occurred without any previous warning. According to the Barbanel, the third plague of each group was directed against the human body, which was not the case with the preceding two plagues. Well, this was an indication that the previous two warnings were not meant to bring about any physical punishment as much as to achieve an educational objective. It was only when that goal was not achieved that the body was punished. In addition, the plagues were a sort of coming out party for God Almighty. It was a tool whereby the Jewish nation was reintroduced to God, their Father in Heaven. It also served as a means of uprooting the hearts of the children of Israel from their heretical views that they'd adopted in Egypt during their years of slavery. The Kassav Sofer stated that the warning served as a means to allow Paro the opportunity to prepare his magicians to demonstrate their alleged powers. However, with these three plagues, the plagues of lice, boils, and darkness, it was evident that they would be unable to respond. Regarding lice, well, sorcery is not capable of creating anything smaller than a lentil. When the plague of boils struck, the magicians were too sick to appear before Paro, and then during the plague of darkness, no Egyptian was able to move from their place for three days. So in the end, Paro's magicians proved to be no match against Moshe and the God of the Jews. This forno says in reference to Rehuda's division of the ten plagues into the acronym of Ditzak Adash Biachav, which we read in our Pesach Haggadahs. He stated that the first three plagues, the tzach, stand for blood, frogs, and lice, are all earthbound. The second group of plagues, adash, wild animals, pestilence, and boils, strike both man and animals equally. And the third group of plagues, the achav, hail, locusts, and darkness, take place in the sky. So these nine events were followed by makot v'choros, the killing of the firstborn the decisive plague that brought about the liberation of the children of Israel from Egypt. All of the plagues demonstrated God Almighty's mastery and dominion over all facets of creation. You know, it's interesting that the Torah does not mention that Paro called Moshe to pray to put an end to each one of the plagues. It would seem that Paro did not call Moshe and Aaron to pray for him unless he was concerned about the deadly effect that the plague presented. So the plague of blood, for example, was not life-threatening. And as a result, Paro was not overly concerned about the plague. It was not until the second plague, the plague of frogs, that Paro called Moshe and Aaron to pray to God that he remove the plague. You know, the plague of frogs contained two separate elements. Their loud croaking sounds could be heard all through Egypt. This was in addition to the fact that the frogs entered their bodies. Well, this fact frightened them, since it threatened their survival. When Paro asked Moshe to remove the plague, he said, Me meni, from me. 
since he feared for his own survival. The plague of lice, even though Paro watched it as magicians admitted that it was Etzba Lokem, the finger of God, still his heart remained obstinate, for although the plague was painful, it did not represent any danger to life. The plague of wild animals, well, that was truly fear-inspiring. This was the first time that Paro was willing to negotiate as to where the service of God could take place. Due to his fear, he did plead with Moshe to pray on his behalf. You know, the shame Yishmuel stated that during the plague of wild animals, Paro calls Moshe and Aaron, and he says to them that the children of Israel can go and sacrifice to their God. Then afterwards, he asks them to pray for him. The order seems to be reversed. One would have thought that he would have first asked them to pray that all the animals be removed, and only then would he agree to allow the Jewish nation to leave Egypt. The primary intent of the ten plagues was not just to punish the Egyptians for their wickedness, it also gave them an opportunity to stop and to think about the error of their ways and to repent. You know, they could have withdrawn their opposition at any time and released the Jewish nation. Had they accepted upon themselves the kingship of God Almighty, he would have forgiven them for all of their sins. God in his great benevolence left open the possibility of teshuva, repentance for the Egyptians at any time during the plagues. We can now understand the order in which Paro presented his statements to Moshe and Aaron. The Ibn Ezra suggests that if he had made his demand, pray for me, before his agreement to release the children of Israel, well, then Paro would have only been making a business arrangement. This was not what God Almighty intended the plagues to promote. God wanted the plagues brought upon Egypt to prompt Paro to the state of true and unconditional teshuva, repentance. The plague of pestilence did not move Paro much. It did not present any real danger to people since its effect was felt mostly by the animals. That being the case, he did not consider releasing the children of Israel, nor did he ask Moshe to pray for him. The next plague was boils. Again, it was not painful, but it, but it was pardon me, painful, but not life-threatening. Therefore, Paro was not moved to request that Moshe pray that the plague be removed. That was even though his magicians could not even make an appearance to their weakened physical condition. The plague of hail, well, that was a major devastation, not only ruining the crops in the field, but also killing those Egyptians that failed to heed God's warnings. This plague was the first time that Paro admitted that he and his people had sinned against God Almighty. He pleads with Moshe to pray for himself and his people he even agrees to release the children of Israel unconditionally. The plague of locusts was the first time that Paro's servants pressured him to negotiate for the release of the Jewish nation even before the plague began. Then once it did begin, he pleaded with Moshe to pray to God that he should remove his death from him. During the plague of darkness, we do not find that Paro asked Moshe to pray. The reason may be very logical. After all, the first three days of the plague, Paro tried to counteract the darkness with lanterns. Then, the last three days, the darkness was so thick that he was not able to move at all. Once the plague ended, he tells Moshe that the children of Israel are free to go, but that they must leave their livestock in Egypt. However, since the plague has ended, well, there was no need for Paro to ask Moshe to pray for him. We know that there is no story in the Torah that is not without a much deeper meaning. I believe that of the four-fifths of the Jews that died during the days of darkness, many, many may have had Egyptian fathers. I say this for a few reasons. First, the Torah testifies that the Jews in Egypt were idol worshippers, and we know that idol worship was steeped in sexual immorality. Secondly, we read in the portion of Lech Lecha, that when Abram Avinu, Abraham, our father, went down to Egypt during the famine, he hid Sarah Imenu, Sarah, our mother, in a box. He was concerned, you see, since Sarah was one of the five most beautiful women in history, and the Egyptian people were known as an ugly people. He feared that they would abduct Sarah and kill him. So the fact that the children of Israel were a beautiful nation and the Egyptians were not would have made them even more desirable. 
That is in addition to the fact that the children of Israel served under an oppressive slavery. The Torah testifies that the Egyptians were also known as a licentious people. They even had relations with their animals. So a slave was a step up. We also read in the portion of Emor. There it relates the story of the Makalel, the blasphemer. He was the only individual in the desert who cursed God. In addition, the Torah also records that he was the only Jew who had an Egyptian father. I believe that the reason why the Torah relates this story is to tell us that if the other four-fifths of the Jews who died during the days of darkness would have lived, they would have been a cancer to the viability of the nation. The Tanthuma states that the plagues that God brought upon Paro in Egypt were all mida kenega mida, tit for tat, a sort of payback for all the evil that Paro and his people had perpetrated against the children of Israel while they were enslaved in Egypt. God first punished the Egyptians with blood. Well, this was because they did not permit the daughters of Israel to observe ritual immersion, thereby preventing them from having marital relations with their husbands and reproducing. It was Aaron and not Moshe who brought this plague. God said to Moshe that it is not proper that the water that protected you when you were cast into the Nile or the earth that protected you when you killed the Egyptian should be struck by you. Why were they punished with frogs? The Tanakhuma states that while the children of Israel were enslaved, the Egyptians ordered them to bring them reptiles and creepy creatures, which were an abomination to Israel. In retribution, he brought frogs upon them. Whenever an Egyptian would fill his cup to drink, as he brought the cup to his mouth, it was filled with frogs. The frogs were found everywhere, even in the heated ovens. Why was the plague of pestilence brought upon the Egyptians? Because they had forced the children of Israel to shepherd their herds, their flocks, and their camels. All of these animals were scattered over hills, valleys, and even in the wilderness. The Egyptians did so in order to prevent the Jews from multiplying. Why were they punished with boils? Because they had forced their Jewish slaves to heat, warm things for them, and to keep cool things that were cold. In either case, causing them physical distress. They were punished with boils so that they were unable to even touch their own bodies due to the boils. A great meal accompanied this plague. You see, Moshe threw handfuls of soot heavenward, which reached up to the throne of glory. In addition, when soot is thrown into the air, it will only cover a limited area. However, in this case, the soot covered all of Egypt at exactly the same moment. Why were the Egyptians punished with hail? Because they had forced the children of Israel to tend to their gardens, orchard, and vineyards. God therefore brought a hailstorm upon them and destroyed their trees and vineyards, as it states. The hail struck all the vegetation in Egypt. All the produce that was in the fields was struck by the hail, and every tree in the fields were shattered. It also states in the portion of Baera that there was hail and fire flashing within the hailstones. Well, this then was a miracle within a miracle. Now, even though fire and hail are naturally combatants, however, during this plague of hail, the two made peace with each other. As the verse states, that there was hail and fire together within the hailstones. In addition, Repintho says that the hail came down like an axe and cut down all the trees. Why were they plagued with locusts? Because they forced the children of Israel to plant wheat and barley for them. So God Almighty had the locusts devour all the produce that the Jews had planted for them. Initially, the Egyptians were happy to see the locusts, since they viewed them as a certain delicacy. They even pickled them in barrels. But then, when the plague ended, God brought a strong westerly wind, which miraculously carried away all the locusts, even those that had been pickled in jars and barrels. Why did God bring the planet plague of darkness on them? Because amongst the Israelites there were those who had Egyptian patrons, and they lived in affluence and honor. So they did not want to leave Egypt. God, knowing their thoughts, brought the thick darkness that lasted for three days, and this is when these Jews died. This fact was hidden from the Egyptians, so that they wouldn't say that just as we were afflicted, so too were the Jews afflicted. God therefore brought the thick darkness so that the Egyptians could not see the Jews burying their dead. 
How were the plagues divided? Three were assigned to Aaron, three to Moshe, and three were directly directed personally by God himself. The plagues of flood, frog, and lice, which came from the land, were assigned to Aaron. Hail, locust, and darkness, which are connected to the air, were assigned to Moshe. Moshe's power extended over heaven and earth. The plagues of wild animals, pestilence, and the plague of the firstborn were all directed personally by God Almighty himself. However, they all participated in the plagues of boils. Paros phrased his statements to Moshe and Aaron in a way that would give them the impression that his tshuva was sincere. He did so by making his request for help only after he agreed to release the Jewish nation. Well, this implied that he was prepared to release them even if Moshe was reneged on his promise to remove all the plagues. Since Moshe was aware that coercion was the primary reason for Paro's change of heart, he would only pray for Paro if he felt that his tshuva, his repentance, was both sincere and unconditional. We too can learn a great lesson from this story as to how we should engage in our own tshuva. Just like God demanded that Paro's tshuva be sincere and unconditional, well, so too does he expect us to admit our sins and sincerely resolve to do better in the future. A person's prayers should not be dependent on results, meaning that if God answers him in the affirmative, then he will repent. And if not, then he will recant on all that he had promised. You know, many times we, many times we observe in time that God's choice is far better than ours would have been. One should be steadfast and not deviate from the new level of commitment. By doing so, we can rest assured that our tshuva will be perfect and acceptable before God, our Father in Heaven. Once we have developed that relationship with Him, we can be certain and confident that whenever we are in need of His assistance, He will always be there for us. We should always keep in mind that the word prayer Prayer is an acronym for the, for the words, please respond after you examine a request. So let us all pray that God Almighty in heaven answers all of our prayers. To free all the hostages safely, cure the injured, console the mourners, and protect all the brave IDF soldiers and civilians with the coming of Mashiach Sukainu quickly and in our time. Again, let me thank you for listening and for attending. Again, anything, any prayers that you can say, any donation that you can make, again, for our brethren in Israel will be appreciated. Again, we need to break down the gates of heaven and may God, again, bring salvation to the Jewish nation and to the world with the coming of Mashiach. Again, if you could, please uh, subscribe, push like and share. And again, thank you very much for attending. There will be a musical uh, original song that will be uh, played again in a minute. So please stay tuned. God bless and be well. Shabbat Shalom.